Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for the awesome privilege to be called children of God. And we thank you so much for saving us, for putting your spirit in us. We thank you for giving us your word that leads us and guides us on the right path. We thank you, Lord, that we live under an open heaven where your voice always comes to us in season. That we are not in a famine land with regards to the word of God. And we thank you so very much for this blessing. We know that you are alive, that you are alive in us, and that you are present with us. And we ask that you will convey your heart, your mind, and your spirit, Lord, into our spirits, giving us understanding concerning your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we want to get straight into the word because of time. So let's turn into the book of Colossians chapter 3. That's our water baptism text. <laughs> Just have things all over the place. Okay, Colossians chapter 3. And we're just going to be reading some three very short verses of Scripture, beginning at verse 1. It says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your affection on things above not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. If you could just drop my monitor a little bit, I'll appreciate it. Thanks. Now, the book of Colossians is very similar in nature to the book of Ephesians. They are doctrinal books. And these two books highlight the preeminence and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is revealed in this book as the image of the invisible God, the creator of all things, the one who holds all things together, and the one by whom all things consist. The first two chapters of this book focus on the fundamentals of who Christ is and what he did for us at Calvary. And the last two chapters give us practical instructions as to how we should live our lives. And that's the basic layout for most of the epistles in the New Testament. And it's good for us to understand how it is written so that we can better appreciate as we read. In chapters 3 and 4, we see references made to being dead and to being, and to being made alive. We see references made to heavenly things and to earthly things and to the old man and the new man. And this tells us that as born-again believers, we are a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the new things, re and the new things spoken of here refer to all that God has imputed to us. He has given to us a new nature. He has given to us a new position in Christ. He has given to us a new name. We are now called children of God. He has given to us a new life. And he has translated us into a new kingdom called the kingdom of God. And so having established this fact in chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians... 
And having received the salvation from the Lord with all of its benefits and all of its privileges, the Apostle Paul, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying to us this morning, as the saints of God, as children of God, he's saying to us in verses 1 and 2 of our text, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, he's saying to us today, seek those things which are above. He is saying, if you then are born again, if you profess to be a child of God, if you profess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and that we are on our way to heaven, he is saying to us today, seek those things which are above. And set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. Now from these two verses of scripture, we clearly see the reality and the existence of two kingdoms. The kingdom of God which is above and the kingdom of this world which we have been delivered from, which is under the rule of of Satan himself. And we are instructed in the word of God that we should seek those things from above, from the kingdom of God, which implies that we should seek heavenly things. Now, all this might be very basic for most of us, but we need to be reminded today of the fundamentals because we are living in days of great destruction and we are living in days of great deception. And many believers in Christ are losing their focus as to what God requires of us and what is important. The word seek is not a passive word. It's an active word. And it means to pursue. It means to follow after and to strive towards you know, when we were children, we used to play a game called hide and seek. And the seeker, whoever that was, whether it was us or somebody else, didn't stand up in one place. In order to find the one who was hiding, they had to diligently pursue and look and search out the person. Not so? Similarly, to seek out the things that are above is something that we have to actively pursue. It is not a one and done thing. It is not stagnant. It is something that we have to pursue throughout our life here on earth. In like manner, the phrase that is used in verse 2, to set our affection, means that we should set our mind on the things that are above. And this speaks about a deliberate and a conscientious choice to follow the Lord and to obey his commandments. To set our affections is something that we deliber deliberately make a decision to do. To set our mind and our heart to follow the Lord and to obey his commandments. It speaks about remaining focused and being resolute concerning our walk with the Lord. It is to set our face like a flint or like flint with unwavering determination to stay the course, to be what God has called us to be and to do what God has called us to do. We need to set our minds on this path to do what God has called us to do. To be what God has called us to be. To remain focused and to remain resolute. Now this doesn't mean that it is wrong to attend to the things of this life. Because we are seeking the things that, that are above. It doesn't mean that it is wrong to look at the news or to be aware of what is going on in our world. It doesn't mean that... We shouldn't enjoy the simple pleasures of watching a movie or going to the beach or having a hobby 
or traveling, etc. What it means is our primary focus and priority should be the things of God. Our primary focus and priority should be the things of God. The things that pertain to the kingdom of God and to spiritual things. This is what it means to set our minds on the things that are above. To seek the things that are above. And sad to say, in the body of Christ today, many in the body of Christ have lost sight of this fact. And as a result, many in the church world live their lives with no real pursuit of God. They live their lives with no desire for the things of God, with no commitment to spiritual service and activity. They attend church out of form, but in their heart, the, the love for the things of this life takes precedence over the things of God. And that is why we admonish that if we say that we are born again, if we say that our citizenship is in heaven, that Jesus is our Lord, we need to pursue and seek the things of the kingdom of God. People who deviate, who have no passion for God, they pursue earthly pleasures and gratification. They pursue wealth. They pursue prestige. They seek to please themselves. But I want us to hear the words of Jesus this morning. Found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. He says, he said to his disciples then, and he's saying to us today, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures, where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, he says, there will your heart be also. <laughs> when Jesus made this statement, what he was saying was and is, there are earthly treasures and there are heavenly treasures. Earthly tre treasures, he teaches us, will not last. They cannot satisfy. And they will not count in eternity. Heavenly treasures, on the other hand, will count in this life as well as in the life that is to come. And we are told that we need to lay up treasures in heaven. And how do we lay up treasures in heaven? We lay up these treasures by investing. By investing our time. By investing our labor. By investing our resources in the kingdom of God. Just as we would invest in earthly things with our resources and time and so on. So too, to invest in the kingdom of God, to lay up treasures in heaven, we need to invest in like manner. It is investing our time in prayer and devotion to God, in seeking his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you know that when we do things for the kingdom of God, with the uh, seeking first his kingdom and his objective and his will and purpose. We are investing and there are rewards that we will get when we get to heaven. God will bless us and there are things that we will come into both here in this life and also in the years when we go on to be with the Lord. We invest, we lay up treasures in heaven when we pray, when we give ourselves over to pray for souls. God's, the heart of Jesus is for the lost. He's not willing that any should perish. He, for this purpose, he came into the world to save and to, to seek and to save those that are lost. And so therefore, when we partner with God, not seeking our own will 
And we really give of our time to intercede on behalf of the lost. Not just those of our families, even though we are required to do so. But the lost souls of this world. Because God is seeking people from every nation. Every tribe, every tongue, every place in society. He's not a respecter of persons. And so when we give ourselves to pray in this like, in like manner. When we pray concerning his kingdom's work here on earth, the advancement of his kingdom, the furtherance of the gospel, we lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. Our labor will not be in vain, and we are actually doing spiritual work that will last and count for eternity. We also lay up treasures by investing in spiritual service to the Lord, better known as ministry, which involves serving others, blessing others, helping those in need, visiting and praying for those who are sick. This is how we invest in the kingdom of God. This is how we lay up treasures in heaven. And we also invest when we honor the Lord with our giving, with our tithes and with our offerings, which are designed to build up the kingdom of God here on earth, to help people in need, and to propagate the furtherance of the gospel. And these are the things, brothers and sisters, that we are to seek and that we are to follow after and that we are to give priority to in our lives. These are all spiritual things. And this is what we need to pursue and follow after. Seeking the things that are above where God, where, this, where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Now Jesus said to us, where your treasure is, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. There are many in the kingdom who say that they love the Lord. Amen? There are many who say they love the Lord, but they don't treasure the things of God. To treasure something is to deem it valuable. To treasure something is to deem it valuable. And what we consider to be valuable on those things would our heart and our affections be fixed. If we treasure earthly things, then our heart and our attention and our time will be given over to the things of this life. Similarly, if we treasure, if our treasure is the Lord, you know, we sing this song, my treasure, my priority, <laughs> everything, you are my everything. If our treasure is the Lord, and if we treasure the things and all the benefits that he has given to us, our heart will be fixed on him. We will follow after him. We would make time for him. We would strive to please him and to be like him. We would love his house. We would love his people. And we would honor his word. But there are many who say they love God. But they don't deem the things of God valuable. David said in Psalms 27 and verse 4. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Brothers and sisters, this morning, if we truly treasure our salvation and all that Jesus purchased for us, we would seek to preserve it. We would not take it for granted we would not trade it for earthly things. If we truly treasure our salvation, if we truly hold it as valuable to us, then we would seek to preserve it. We would not take it for granted. We would not take it as a slight thing. We would not exchange it for anything else in this world. And what comes to mind when we talk about our inheritance in Christ and what Jesus has done for us. What comes to mind is Esau. Esau, for those of you who may not be familiar too much with your Old Testament, 
Esau was the grandson of Abraham and one of the sons of Isaac. And we read about his life in Genesis 25. And we are told in this chapter that Esau was a hunter and he was a man of the field. And one day after a long day hunting in the woods, he was hungry, he was famished to the point of being faint. And having returned home, his brother was there. Um, he was more like a homeboy. He was a dresser, I think, of, you know, keeper of the vineyards or whatever. But he was at home and he was preparing a pot of lentils. And Esau came in and he was so famished and he must have smelled the, his brother's pot. And he said to his brother, Jacob, give me to eat for I am faint. And Jacob make a, made a bargain with him. He said, sell me your birthright and I will give you the lentils. Now in those days, the firstborn son of a family, the Jewish family, and in other cultures too, the firstborn son was entitled to special inheritance rights. In those days, I think in some countries, they still practice that custom. But Esau was the firstborn. They were twins, but he was the first son that came forth from his mother's womb. And as a result, the birthright belonged to him. And so he was entitled to special inheritance rights. And Jacob, his brother, his twin brother, knew the value of the birthright. And so he bartered with his brother to sell it to him. And this is what Esau said. And I want us to look at it on the board. He said in verse 32 of Genesis 25, he said, Behold, I am at the point to die. This is from hunger. Eh? <laughs> Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? You see where his heart was? He didn't value his inheritance. He didn't value what was laid up for him. He said, what profit shall this birthright do to me? And the Bible says that Esau sold his birthright for a mere pot of lentils. Thus, he despised his birthright. He didn't see it as valuable. He didn't see it as something to be treasured. And as such, he gave up his spiritual inheritance for some earthly gratification, for some food. What are we trading our inheritance in Christ for? What are we trading it for? What are we turning away from the things of God for? For sexual gratification? For material things or material wealth? To get a promotion, we would compromise our stand for Christ? What are we trading our relationship with God for? Companionship? We settle for anything? For entertainment? What are we trading our inheritance for? And we need to ask ourselves this question. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I want us to understand this morning that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of holiness. It's a kingdom where Jesus rules, where he is king, and where justice reigns. And so understanding that we need to seek first the kingdom of God, seek the things that are above, we need to understand that there is no sin in heaven. There is no sin in heaven, and there is no rebellion in heaven. And there, there's no, nothing that is wrong, evil in heaven. 
And so as born-again believers in our day-to-day -day lives, we need to strive towards and we need to strive to reflect all that God is and all that his kingdom stands for. We can't say that we're seeking God, but we're dabbling with things that he forbids. His kingdom is a kingdom of holiness and righteousness. Amen? And so in our day-to-day -day lives, this is where the practical side of Christianity comes in. We need to strive towards and reflect all that God is and all that his kingdom stands for. God hates mixtures. I'll let that so soak in a little bit. He hates mixtures. A mixture is something that consists of several elements. It's a blend of many things. It is neither one thing or the other, nor the other. A mixture changes the original form of something into another thing. If we have a concentrate of one of a drink, let's say, Morby, and we add some sorrel to it, it's no longer Morby. It changes the original form when we mix components together. And the Bible has a lot to say about mixing or mixtures. Because in our day-to-day -day lives, we're mixing all sorts of things. The good with the bad. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 9 to 11 tells us, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds. Speaking about mixtures. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard. Think of your vineyard as your life. With diverse seeds. Lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. And as we heard from our brother Anthony last week, with every Old Testament shadow of instruction, there is a corresponding application of truth in the New Testament. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have been delivered, brothers and sisters, from this world. From this world that has been corrupt, corrupted by sin. This world that is under the rule and domain of Satan. We have been delivered from it. And we have been translated position and positionally into the kingdom of God. And so to still hold on and desire and love and be attached to the things of this world. The Bible says, if we love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in us. There are two kingdoms. It is either we are of one or the other. Jesus said to us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. He said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one or love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is anything other than God. We cannot serve God and other things because we would either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verses 14, sorry, verse 14 tells us, be not unequally yoked together 
with unbelievers. It doesn't say don't talk to unsaved people. It says be not unequally yoked. A yoke is something that binds two people together. It says for what fellowship, note the word, fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. And what communion has light with darkness. To be yoked, brothers and sisters, is to be joined or attached to something or someone. I have never seen two oxen. I remember Pastor showed us a picture of two oxen yoked together some time ago. We've never seen two oxen yoked together going in opposite directions. It's not possible. They can't. The yoke will prevent them. And so for a Christian man or a Christian woman to be yoked or aligned to anything that is not of God or to an unbeliever is compromise. And it is tantamount to selling our birthright for earthly gratification. Somebody has to compromise for us to, for us to go in the same direction, light and darkness. If we are yoked to the un fruitful works of darkness and the things that God forbids us to join ourselves to, then we have to be walking in the same direction as the person or the thing that is ungodly or unrighteous. Not so? We can't walk together. The Bible says two cannot walk together except they agree. So the question is, what fellowship has light with darkness? And what communion has righteousness with unrighteousness? And the answer is rhetorical. There is none. The two cannot mix. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 16 to 17, No man puts a, new, puts a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. Now this is a, God was, Jesus was using an analogy. It's, it's literal, yes, but it's also, he's also bringing a point across. And what he's saying to us is that all ways and habits cannot coexist with the holy things of God. We are required, brothers and sisters, to change. A new life in Christ requires and demands a new way of thinking and behaving. The new wine of God's spirit in us, he says, cannot coexist with the old. The bottle will break. We wouldn't be able to follow through. The new life in Christ requires and demands a new way of thinking and behaving and it requires a new way of living. There is a lot going on in Christendom today. And if we are not careful to maintain our focus and to recognize what God requires of us, we can be easily misled by all sorts of doctrines and theologies and the opinions of people that would make us feel comfortable in our sin and in our worldly lifestyle. And there's a lot of that going on in Christendom today. There is no tolerance in the word of God for mixtures. We cannot mix the things of this world with the life, with the life in Christ. We must choose, choose to follow, choose to seek the things that are above and as it is now, in the world that we are living in and in Christendom, there are many in the body of Christ who name the name of Christ and who are mixing the holy with the unholy, meaning they are handling the things of God. Some are even involved in ministry, but behind closed doors, when they leave the house of God, they are involved in all sorts of things that are unclean, and unrighteous and ungodly in the sight of God. 
There are many that are, that are living double standard, double standards, double, a double standard lifestyle. Many in the kingdom of God. They're one way in church, and when they're outside, they live a totally different life. Like if Jesus don't be at their home or wherever they go. And what I have found is, we often use the word little to trivialize our sin. We often use the word little to trivialize our sin. And we use phrases like, well, I only took a little look, and I only took a little drink, and I only took, told a little lie, and I only said a little curse word. What we don't realize, brothers and sisters, is the reality of when we take a little look, what we consider little, we can actually undress somebody with that little look. Somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's husband or wife with what we consider a little look. Sometimes all it takes is a little look to get us hooked on porn and other filthy activities that come to us right on our television screen. A little look. All I took is a little look. And that little look can bring and has bring, brought many into big bondage. And if we are not careful, we can be in, become entangled by those little areas of disobedience, what we consider little and insignificant where God is concerned. Let's not deceive ourselves. There is no little sin and big sin where God is concerned. Sin is sin. We know about that. And we need to put it away from our lives and seek the things that are above. Strive towards righteousness and holiness and godliness and right living. The word of God tells us a lot about little things. Jesus said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin. But contaminate and defile our bodies, our minds. Songs of Solomon tells us it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Not a big bear coming in. Little foxes rotting. And in the book of James chapter 3, it tells us about the tongue. That even though it's so small, a little member of our bodies... If it is not managed and brought under the control of the Holy Spirit, it can defile our whole body. It will work havoc. Havoc. And he goes on to say the scriptures, he says, could, could bitter and sweet water come out from the same fountain? Can a vine bear figs? No, the answer is no. A good tree will bring forth good fruit. A corrupt tree will bring forth corrupt fruit. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to manage our words and we need to examine. When we hear things come out of our mouths, we need to, and we need to examine ourselves as we heard from Brother Glenroy. What is going on in our minds? Our thought process needs to be renewed. Something is going on in our heart that is not right where God is concerned. So we need to check ourselves and seek, pursue the things of the kingdom of God. Righteousness, holiness in the sight of God. We may think that these things don't matter, but they do if we want to have a right relationship with the Lord. Not everybody concerned about having a right relationship with God. It goes beyond coming to the house of God. But if we're serious 
And we want to maintain and have a right relationship with God. We want to please him. These things matter. And the Lord is calling us as his people today, not only to seek him in prayer and in devotion, but he also wants us to pursue a life of holiness and righteousness. Many of us are devout in prayer, but we live in life any old how. Compromising, double standards. He wants us to seek his face in prayer, but he also wants us to pursue a life of holiness and righteousness. If we are risen with Christ as we profess to be, if we are children of God as we profess, we are required in the word of God to put to death the old man and the deeds of the old nature, not just ignore it. We need to fight against it. We need to strive against it. We need to put it to death. The deeds of the old man, that the corrupt side of us. We have a corrupt side in us, you know. Sin, there's sin that dwells in us. That's why John tells us, if any man say they have no sin, they lie. We have a fallen nature inside of us. And so we are required not to yield to that nature. We, need, we are required to put it to death. And we need to put to death by resisting it. Which is not a one and done thing. It's a continuous ongoing thing. We need to put to death the deeds of the old man by, and yield ourselves to God. And we are empowered to do so. In our own selves, we cannot do it. But we are empowered because the Spirit of God resides within us. And he gives us the power to become all that God has, has called us to be. But we must yield ourselves. To whom you yield yourselves, servants, to obey his servants, you will be. And I will be. And so we are required to yield ourselves unto God. Yield ourselves to the spirit of God. Listen, when the Lord convicts us of something, it's not to condemn us. It is to lead us on the paths of righteousness. So we need to acknowledge his voice. And saying, yes, Lord, I sinned, I did this, that, and the other. Forgive me and strive to do what is right. And as I said before, this is not a one and done thing. It's something that we have to strive to do until Jesus comes or until we die. And so for those of us here this morning who may not be aware, we are instructed in verses 5 to 11 to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And topping the list is fornication. To put it to death. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. And I'm saying this for the benefit of the new converts present here this morning. Present in our midst. How many of you know that we have lambs? We have sheep? <laughs> we have some goats? We have some new converts. We have people at all different levels of Christianity in the house, right? So for those who are young in the faith, new in the faith, fornication is a sin. It's forbidden. We need to put to death um, the lust, the sexual lust and passions of that fallen nature. And we are saying this also on, for the benefit of our young people. And for the benefit of all those who may be indulging in sexual activity outside of marriage. And not just fornication is wrong, according to what the Bible says. How many of you know that sex is a holy thing? It's a thing that has been ordained by God. And it symbolizes it's an outward demonstration of the union between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. A covenant relationship where the two become one. And so anything outside of that perimeter is a corruption from the enemy. It's perverse and it needs to be kept within the ambits of marriage. 
And so not just fornication is wrong or sin, but every other form of sexual perversion and lust and indulgence should be put away from our lives if we are risen with Christ. The standards of this world, brothers and sisters, allow for everything and anything. We are living in a liberal society and everything goes in this world. That's why Jesus said, love not the world. Don't adopt their standards. But the laws that govern the kingdom of God call for a different standard for living. We are called, we are translated into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has different laws and standards. It has, standard, it has laws that, that are opposed to the kingdoms of this world. And we are required to pursue and follow those standards. Covetousness is another attribute, another thing that we need to put to death. It's, a, it's not an attribute of God. It's an attribute of our old man and the fallen nature. And we are required to put to death covetousness in our lives. What is covetousness? <laughs> covetousness is greed. Simply put, greed. It's a lust for things, for material things and for wealth. And it's a form of idolatry. And what works alongside greed are things like envy and jealousy. Because we're always looking at what other people have. Eh? Envy and jealousy and being avaricious and fierce. Especially when it comes to money and material things. We are to put to death covetousness in our lives. If we are risen with Christ. If we are born again. You know how many relationships in the church and in families have been broken down because of money matters? Because of this thing called greed? I mean we will kill and devour people for the sake of money. Kill and devour. And many friendships have been affected. Some even destroyed because of money or because of jealousy and envy and strife and contention. These things are not a part of the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters. And if we want to advance in the Lord, we need to put these things away from our lives and seek the things that are above we need to decrease and God, Jesus, needs to increase in us. His characteristics, his ways needs to grow more inside of us, increase in us. We also need to put away as children of God things like anger and rage, throwing down things and mashing up things when we vex. And cursing when we vex. Put away things like anger. It's all in these verses, you know. Verse 8. But now you also put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. I term it anger, rage, bad talking people. That's what malice is. And filthy speech. We quoted the scripture earlier. All things are passed away. That is spiritually speaking. We have to walk out this truth. Because the old man is still living inside of us. All things are passed away positionally. And spiritually in Christ. But we need to walk out this reality in our day-to-day -day Christian lives. And we need to walk it out in newness of life. And walking in newness of life involves pursuing the things of the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And his righteousness. Yes, 
we have been imputed right. We have been imputed righteousness when we were born again. God gave us his righteousness. We are clothed in his righteousness, but we have to walk in it. We have to walk in it. Throughout the epistles, it's the positional aspect of things, the spiritual, the doctrinal part of what Jesus did for us, but it's the practical aspect of walking in our salvation. We have to strive, brothers and sisters, to be like Jesus. Strive to be like him. Follow, pursue, set our mind to do what is right. It's not automatic. The Bible tells us that faith without works is dead, being alone. And when we think about faith, we talk, some people think that it's faith, faith to move mountains and think, no, 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 no. Faith in God without corresponding works is dead. Having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, making him our Savior and Lord, without the evidence of works of righteousness, is vain, is dead, is dead faith, the Bible says, being alone. It speaks, the works that is, that is spoken of here, speaks about the characteristics of Christ being evidenced through our lives. And that is why we are admonished in verses 12, I believe, verses 12 to 17, we are required concerning all the things that we need to put on. We put in off the old man, but we have to wear Christ. We need, we are required to put him on by being merciful. Why? Because he is merciful. We are required to be kind. Why? Because he is kind. We are required to be humble because he, when he walked this earth, was humble and he was meek. We are required to be long-suffering with one another. Isn't the Lord long-suffering with us? Doesn't he suffer long, 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 long with us? Real long. We are required to forbear with the faults and weaknesses of others. We all have faults. We all have weaknesses, shortcomings, character flaws. And just as we will need, we, we desire mercy when we fall short, we need to show mercy and forbear. You know, just to bear with somebody, we have to bear. That is the heart of Jesus, even towards us. We should ever, we should always be aware of our humanity. I am. That we are subject to failure, subject to error, subject to make mistakes, subject to flaws. Is that an excuse to stay where we are? No. But just as we see ourselves as weak and frail and earth, you know, earthly in that sense, we need to show mercy and forbear with others in like manner. We are required to be forgiven. Isn't the Lord forgiven? Amen. Sometimes it's so hard for us to forgive. But we are required and forgive one another and walk in love, which is the bond of perfectness. Oh, perfectness. Perfectness. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, brothers and sisters, if we are going to live for the Lord, if we are going to be strong, desire to be strong in him, if we desire to have a vital relationship with him, we need to seek him daily. And we need to seek the things of his kingdom. To have a healthy and vibrant relationship with the Lord is not an automatic thing. We have to seek it. We have to follow after it. And we have to set our heart and mind on the things that are above. We are living in very uncertain times. In economic, this, with, you know, this world in economic distress. We're living in 
times of violence and crime and wickedness. And we're living in hard times. The whole world is under the control of the enemy, the devil. And the spirit of Antichrist is already unleashed. Now is not the time, brothers and sisters, to play with our salvation. Now is not the time to play with it. Now is not the time to have one foot in the world and another foot in the church. Now is not the time to be complacent in our walk with the Lord. Now is the time to seek the Lord like never before. And to pursue the things of his kingdom. 2 Timothy 2.16 tells us, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Hear me this morning. Let everyone, or hear the word of the Lord, I should say. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There is a marked difference between people whose hearts are set on the Lord and those whose hearts are set on earthly things. Let us make a decision today to put God first. And we put him first. And when we put him first, when we seek his kingdom first, he said everything else will be added unto us. Don't go following after the things. Follow after God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and all other things he said that we need, that we desire, that is good for us. He said he will add to us. He must be first place in our lives. And if he is first place, the Lord just wants to encourage us today to continue on running the race that is set before us. However, and I'm coming to close, if there's anybody here this morning that have lost their way, you may be involved in things that are displeasing to the Lord, you may be entangled in a relationship or entangled by other things. I want us, and the Lord will have us know this morning that it's never too late to make things right with him. It's never too late. Once we are alive, we have room to repent. The thing is, don't take the mercy and grace for grant, of God for granted because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And so in closing this morning, I want to leave us with a very short but potent scripture found in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7, which says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And I will add to that because there will be a time coming when he will not be near. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and the Lord will have mercy upon him. He that has ears to hear this morning, let's hear what the Spirit of God is saying to his church. God bless you. Let's all stand.
Father, we thank you so much, O oh God, for the richness of your word that continues to come to us. Truly, it is a lamp unto our feet, guiding us and leading us on the paths of righteousness. We just pray today that you will continue to open our ears, Lord, to your voice when you speak, when you convict, when you teach us your ways, when you teach us and show us what is right and what is wrong in your sight. And so we ask today that you will continue, Lord, the work that you have started in our lives. You will continue, Lord, as we yield to you to bring all things into alignment with your perfect will and purpose for us. And that your will for your church in these last days will continue, Lord, to be accomplished. In the name of Jesus, we want to lift up those, O oh God, who may be out of the way, who may be entangled, O oh God, by sin, by things, by people. We pray, O oh God, for the striving of your Holy Spirit to continually, Lord, be with them until they return to the place that they ought to be with you. And so we commit, Lord, our lives into your hands. We commit your church into your hands and we say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. prominent church leader who wrote the book 
your best life now. I don't know if you have that book, but if you do, you could throw it away. You just heard a message on your best life now. This is your best life now. You follow this, you follow that message, and you have your best life now. Were you blessed this morning? Okay, God bless you richly. You may be seated.